autumn seems to be coming, if not having already arrived. And um, I've been scouring the internet for an idea for something to paint and nothing seemed to quite hit the spot. And then suddenly I came across a photo of a row of chickadees sitting, actually I think it was in an elder bush, but I've done elders, so I thought I would um, have a go at that. I did uh, a row of swallows a while ago. In fact, I've painted rows of swallows more or less cons constantly for about 20 years from a photo from the RSPB uh, magazine from, oh, I don't know, 2002 or something. Um, so rows of birds are something that I've always painted and which I like. Um, I think they're really cute. Anyway, so this particular row of chickadees, um, I thought would work. I'm just putting in the last one. I had three here and two there and a gap and I was going to put a couple of leaves in there. In fact, I did put a couple of leaves in there, leaves in there, but having done that, I didn't like it. Uh, it looked funny, so I've taken them out and so now we have one, two, three, four, five, six little birds there. Now chickadees are relatively simple to paint, or at least they can be if you uh, if you make it so, Captain. Um, so anyway, um, yes, I've just remembered I didn't get all my colours out. I'm just putting in another oak leaf up there. And we'll, I don't know, there's an acorn. It looks like the acorn's growing out of the top of that bird's head. That won't do. So sometimes when you're doing something like this, you will find that you need to change the um, design, the arrangement, because it doesn't look right. And that's okay, isn't it? You know, everybody is quite okay with that, I think. So I'm, I'm going to leave that bit blank and just put these two um, leaves in there. Now, colours, just hold on a second. Um, we looked at this wonderful um, drawer the other day, and this is the way I keep most of my paints, which I always have in tubes. I, and then when I take it out of the tube, I put it into one of these little dishes. So I've just realized I have used up the last of my potter's pink. So here's my tube of potter's pink. Here's a nicely washed, fresh little dish. And there's enough potter's pink to keep me going for a significant length of time. I'm going to use that together with Another colour I haven't put out, but I have got it in a dish, which is Naples Yellow. This is Naples Yellow. It's an opaque yellow. Um, somebody did ask about these trays. You can buy them in America. You can get them on Amazon, I think. Blick, Blick Dick Blick, Dick Blick. There's a link to Dick Blick's store in our description below the video and they have them and they're really good because you can get all sorts of different inserts which uh, go into these trays and the trays they go into a, a little specially designed piece of furniture which they slot into like drawers and they sell those too so if you were equipping a studio from scratch or even a corner of your living room uh, if you've got one of their little um, cabinets that these fit into, you could have half a dozen drawers with different insets, inserts, and it's really convenient. It's a very, very good system. Um, right, so the other colours we're going to use, Crinacridone Gold, uh, Olive Green, Burnt Sienna, Sepia, that's the Potter's Pink, that's the Naples Yellow, Black of course, and I, for the leaves of these oaks which are going over and uh, so on, I wanted a bright red, and a, but a particular kind of bright red. And on my rather exhausted Viviva colour sheets, I've got this colour called, which they call Vermilion, and I'm going to use that. So that'll be the only Viviva colour that I use. But that's quite a nice bright red and I think that will bring some of the oak leaves to life. 
I'm going to use my water brush because I find that I can control the water better with it. And um, yes, well, there is a thing. I would never have believed I would have been able to hear myself saying such a thing, even only a few years ago, uh, no, a few weeks, <laughs> a few years. My God, no. Um, yeah, I just found out about these brushes and they're really good. Okay, so the chickadee has a piece of white here, which we need to reserve. And apart from that, he's basically creamy pink <clears throat> color on the breast. So not quite sure. Whoops, that's yellow. Where did that come from? We'll just get rid of that. Let's see how that works. We've got, we've got, uh, there we go. That's okay. That's a sort of yellowish pink. And we put a bit more pink in there like that. And I'll let that <clears throat> do its thing. And we'll come back to that later or for the head. This one I'm going to do more pink. That one, the same but lighter. Maybe I'll use a little dash of sepia. In, oops, that's the back. In the next one. So I'm just using um, black. I don't know which one it is actually. Um, probably lamp, lamp black, I expect. Trying to get the sort of characteristic shape as best I can. This one has got his back turned to us. So I've mixed a little bit of black with a little bit of Naples yellow. And I'm just going to do that there, sort of light, sort of semi halfway turned away. When that's dry, we'll put a bit more shape into that.
Okay, so in a second, I'll stop with that and we'll have to let that dry and then come back in with some darker colors and some shaping. So that's our beginning. And now let's do some nice loose oak leaves. I want to do some, just drop in some different colors I'm using olive green, quinacridone gold, and burnt sienna there. And to do the veins in the leaves, I'm going to use my um, ink pen. It hasn't got any ink in it, but it just scratches in and uh, Makes a nice line. Okay, so we do this one as well. So some nice loose quinacridone gold, just drop in then some, for example, burnt sienna, and then maybe some green, maybe some sepia, and maybe a bit more quinacridone whatever you fancy really, and draw in the veins like that. And then there's an acorn here, so we have a nice rusty brown cup and then a darker nut. And I'll leave that little bit light there Come back to that later. So this painting really is more about leaves than birds, I think. So quinacridone gold, burnt sienna. Don't bother to clean your brush out in between. Don't need to do that. If you're using, especially if you're using one of these um, water brushes. Just drop the branch in there, the twig. So we go back here to the quinacridone, burnt sienna, touch of green, sepia. in the veins <clears throat> and then let's draw a little bit more of the branch there perhaps we'll put the branch in along here then I can put their feet in I used a watercolor brush to uh, not watercolor brush I used a watercolor pencil to do this drawing with, in the hope that some of it would just dissolve into the paint as we went along. <clears throat> Okay. 
Okay, so back to the leaves. These are really fun to do. I haven't actually used, I said I was going to use the um, vermilion, didn't I? So there we go, let's put some vermilion in that one. And then some green. Oops, got a hair there. It's probably from the cat. This one back here, I think I'm just going to do in in yellow, perhaps with a touch of vermilion. Just make that one mostly yellow. And then here we have a an acorn. Let's do this one in burnt sienna, perhaps with a touch of green. It's very good <clears throat> practice for um, wet in wet. And obviously for painting leaves, especially oak leaves. Let's put their feet in. Okay, and uh, up here we have another two leaves. So same deal, we'll try the same kind of thing. Acorns. <clears throat> Excuse me, my. Cord. 
coughing. It doesn't matter what I eat these days, it makes me cough. I just ate a quality street and it's going to be the death of me. Hopefully not. So I'm going to have to let that dry, I think. He's got his legs in there. Yep, I'm going to have to let that dry because it's four o'clock and the dogs need feeding. Okay, so this is dry now and um, I'm going to come in with a bit more black and strengthen up the colour of the, uh, the bird's head. Make them a bit more black rather than grey because what happens with um, watercolour paint, as you know, is that it often dries much lighter than it is when it goes on. So you have to almost always go back in and um, grey, black rather, is one of the colours that is particularly prone to that. Also, I think this paper that I'm working on is a little bit absorbent, a little bit more absorbent than some others. And if you've got absorbent paper, it will suck the colour in with the water. And then it'll seem to be paler. So I'm just darkening that all down. It's annoying, isn't it, when just like that your hand kind of just jumps a little bit. I'm lucky it doesn't happen very often, but it's happening more often. I'm trying to keep the beaks nice and small because that makes the bird look cuter. made a mistake there. I painted over the bit that was meant to be kept white. So I've put some white gouache there to cover it up to try to restore the white. And I'll have to come in again with a bit more in a minute when it's dry to try and make that correction. Okay, now I'm going to do the actual little eyes in pen. I can't find it. What did I just do? Oh, there it is. Um, and what I normally do, I mean, this one, you can't really see it, but I'll just put something in there, just a sort of semicircle like that. Uh, I usually do a circle 
and leave a dot in it for the white. These ones have got their eyes set into black anyway, so it doesn't show much, but somehow it makes a difference to do that little bit of round. And you can also sharpen up the tip of the beak. So it looks a bit cuter. And I'm going to go back to my, if I can find it, what did I do with it? There it is. Discovered there's a drawer in this table. Forgot about that. It's useful. Okay, so we just try to restore that white a bit. This is where you get to the point of saying to yourself to spatter or not to spatter. To, to be or not to be, that is the question. I'm on a non-spattering phase at the moment. I think. So I think, I think I'm going to probably call it a day. Today I'm going to have a go at painting a pine cone. This is a photo of a white pine cone and uh, we're going to do a very loose version of this which is going to involve basically scribbling in the lights and then the darks for the cone and then just indicating some of the needles on the actual branches uh, very uh, lightly, so just to make a, a sketch really, just to get started with pine cones because they are quite um, tricky really. Uh, there's lots of different ways of painting them and I'm going to try to show you various different ways of doing this. Um, and so I thought we would start with a loose one and then perhaps do some that are a little bit more um, structured. But anyway, the loose ones, I think, look better in any case. So let's, uh, let's do that. So the colours I'm going to be using are sepia, which is a very dark brown, quinacridone gold, because why not? Um, permanent rose, which is going to be, to a certain extent, mixed with the quinacridone to make a kind of brownish colour. Um, burnt sienna. And um, for the needles, I'm going to use olive green, but I will be mixing that with quinacridone to give a more warm colour. And uh, so, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> there we are. And so I'm going to put that to one side. Um, we'll need a pencil, just a quick sketch. And um, I'm going to use my um, bamboo um, pen, if you can call it that, uh, for the um, needles and um, a rigger from Zen Art for the spatter, which is obligatory at the end. Other than that, I'm going to use, guess what, my water brush, just because it's, don't tell anyone, it's easier. Once you get the hang of it, it is. Anyway, never mind. If you don't want to use a water brush, don't worry. I will not send in the brush police. You are permitted. And uh, what I use is either uh, Zen Art, this is the Black Tulip set, and the information about these brushes is on the website, on the blog. If you go and have a look at the website, you'll find that there's a blog entry for every day that we do a video. Um, I'm going to <laughs> add grey hairs to my um, locks if I carry on like this, but anyway, for the moment we are able to do that. And I also use these draw well brushes from Japan, which I get from there direct, so that's also information in the description below I think you'll find. Today, this morning, I've been trying to remind myself how to do autumnal things and here we have a little sketch in my um, Viviva sketchbook which has got really nice paper in it. <clears throat> I don't know what it is, it, they won't tell me. They say it's 100% cotton, it might very well be. Um, last few days I've been doing a few odds and ends. Um, this is a mousse or 
It was called a reindeer. I don't know if it's a reindeer. It looks like a moose to me, but anyway, it's a moose deer. Um, might do something like that for a Christmas card a bit later on, maybe. Thinking about little cutesy kind of description type houses in in the mountains with pines and bunny rabbits and so that's something very early on in the um, in the uh, what do you call it creative process that is and then this morning I've done this and this is roughly what we're going to do next so put that away put that away I've got a piece of paper here which is stretched so if you don't know how to stretch paper take a look at the video that's about stretching paper and um, that will show you that it's not beyond the skills of anyone and it's really worthwhile doing. I do like painting in sketchbooks too but at the end of the day when I come back to stretched paper I must admit I, uh, I like that. I appreciate that. So we're going to um, just draw in a branch like this. As far as I can tell from, we don't have white pines here. Well, I'm surrounded by pines but not these ones, not these um, uh, what would you call them? E super elegant, actually, because they have this amazing um, shape, the long, slim pine cone, and then these uh, elegant, long needles. We, don't, we have short, stubby ones here in Brittany. Everything in Brittany is short and stubby. The cats have got super short legs, so short that their stomachs practically touch the ground. And the Bretons, well... Um, yes, least said, soonest mended. The average height of the average French person is about, I think, five foot ten male f over the whole of France. In Brittany, the average height is about five foot three. I feel huge here. I'm five foot three. And uh, this is the only place I've ever lived where I feel like a giant. It's ridiculous. Anyway, I'm just drawing basically the outline. I'm not going to draw in the scales. I'm just drawing in the outline so that we get the shape roughly right. And so that's that. And then we're going to have a little twiggy bit coming down here and a, a, a slightly bigger twiggy bit coming down here. And then I'm going to put the needles here. I hope I've left myself enough space. Now, one way of doing this is to, to do the painting, is to paint the outside edges of the scales light. And if you've got this kind, where's it gone? Here we are. Uh, this kind, this is a short, fat, stubby one. This, and as you can see, it's interesting this, because when you look at a pine cone properly, and something I rarely do, but I did today, you can see um, the ends of the scales are light, and then going in, it's dark. So one way of drawing this is to, like this, I'll show you. Um, first of all, draw the light bits. I nicked this off the internet. Draw the light bits like that, and then fill in the dark bits like that, and then fill in even more dark bits, and lo and behold, it stands out like that. So that's a good way to do it. That's not what I'm going to do today. So there we are, and the um, the, pie, the needles are going to come out like this and go down like that, I hope. So <clears throat> that's pine cone can go and sit over there. We'll come back to you later. Um, right, the brush. Let's make sure I've got water in it. Yes, I have. I think I've got enough water in it. Uh, so I'm going to mix up a kind of light golden brown using quinacridone gold and burnt sienna. And the colour isn't really that important, it doesn't really matter exactly what it is. Um, and then I'm going to um, kind of, just looking for my reference material here. I'm going to basically do a sort of random, well, you can see what I'm doing. Maybe I might add a little bit of pink. So 
So we forget all about the fact that it's a regular kind of structure with a very geometric pattern to it and all the rest of it, which it is. Forget all about that and just plonk in some colour and leave gaps. That's the key. Leave plenty of gaps. And then while it's still wet, come in and drop dark darks like this sort of into that light colour but, but sometimes out. This is sepia. And then just let that run for a bit. And um, then <clears throat> you might want to do the branch. So I've got sepia with burnt sienna. And um, I'm just going to do a very broken, trying to make it as broken. There's a very strong tendency in all of us to make everything neat and tidy, except for my bedroom, of course. Um, but don't try to try to let it jump around a bit. It's very hard to do that. I don't know why. I suppose some people are better at it than others, but I do find that difficult. I always want to join up all the dots. <clears throat> and then where you did the darks, come back again with some more dark, perhaps a bit thicker, perhaps a bit richer. Just go over the same places. Maybe add a little bit of pink. See how that's dried so faint? It's just crazy. I don't know why. So I don't know why. I, I don't even want to talk about it. I must get some of those core paints and see if they're any better at holding their colour. Now we don't want to go on and on and on about this too much. I might want to add a little bit of black in there too. So I'll go to my black or Payne's grey, doesn't matter, and just put some of that in. Because if this acts true to form and continues to lighten up as it dries, then my shadow, shadowy areas are going to disappear. Okay, I said we'd have a little twiggy bit there too, didn't I? All right, so now I have to leave that to, <clears throat> to dry a bit. And so then I'm going to um, do the needles. And I've got some olive green here and I've, <clears throat> excuse me, I have, um, mixed up a little puddle of it like that. So I'm just putting my little dish like that so that I've got somewhere I can dip my pen into. And then, so I'm gonna do that with this bamboo pen and then I'm just going to do it like this. They're pretty straight, so I'm having to make a bit of effort not to bend them. And these ones over here, I 
long. This is one of those things where you can just do as many as you feel like. You don't, you're not limited because to be quite honest, the average pine tree is covered in these. But sometimes a little bit of white space is um, a good thing. So make sure you don't overdo it, I suppose. And um, that seems to be drying okay. And just add a little bit more in the center there near to the twig where it's coming out. There's a woman, I don't know who, what her name is, um, on, she's on YouTube and she does absolutely amazing white pine cones that look absolutely realistic. You look at them and you think it's a photo, it's amazing. I can't do that. This is all I can do. Um, so then I'm going to take my rigger, which is my long haired brush, and I'm going to um, try to avoid spraying myself. And I'm going to spatter, I find it works best when I spatter towards myself, which is why I say I'm gonna try and avoid getting it on me. Um, but also you can go in the opposite direction too. So that was green and then do the yellow that way because if you come towards you you get a kind of um oval sort of dot if you go away from you you get more of a round dot like that okay so i'm going to put a few black spatters on the cone and then i'm going to wait for that to dry and see whether it's a complete mess or whether it's halfway worth doing anything with so I have to rub out the pencil marks, so we'll see what happens when that's dry. So the painting's dry now, and uh, I'm just going to come in with um, a little bit of uh, white gouache just to put in a few little highlights there. You might want to think about that as being you know, a touch of snow or something like that, and you can do that as much as you want. So just to, I don't know, make it look a bit more realistic. And then that's just white gouache. And then um, you could, you might want to um, just darken down the, um, the pine needles a little bit. You might want to just put in one or two extra darker lines there. Doesn't need very much. Okay, so that's pretty much it. You could put in a bit of background, a bit more of a green in the back, or you could put some blue. Um, you can play around as much as you like with the, the white, just to give more shape. I've sharpened up the edges here a little bit too with the, um, with the dark brown, just because sometimes you can just give a little, oh, that's not dark enough. A little dark edge can make the shape a little bit better. But uh, yeah, fiddle around as much as you like. Today I'm going to do a couple of autumn trees and I'm not going to um, put a lot of detail into this. Um, I'm going to have a go at doing a really loose and splashy tree, starting with the leaves. So um, I've got three colours here that I thought I would use, which are Burnt Sienna, Canacridone Gold, and this one is Venetian Red, which is kind of semi-opaque reddish brown, um, which is going to give quite a lot of solidity to the colours. And um, I've got my glass pen, because I'm going to add ink for the structure, and I've also got my bamboo pen, uh, for the same reason and I've got some Indian ink here 
and it's possible I might want to use some of my found objects, my uh, sticks and feathers, but I'm not sure yet. So first thing I'm going to do is uh, find my water and I'm going to make a mess on here. Um, and I think I'm, I'm just pondering which brush to use. I think I haven't used this one for a while. I have been using it, but I've been using it to dust off the bits and pieces on paper. Um, so I think I might use that. So I'm going to make it wet. And then I'm going to just put some water on there. And then I'm not going to use this for the paint because I think it's just going to soak up a huge amount of paint and um, uh, that would be very wasteful. So I'm looking for something. Oh, now, what about this? It's the baby brother of this Isabel here. This is a similar kind of structure of brush, as you can see, it's bound around the edges here. Um, but this won't take too much, will it? So um, I'm not quite sure what color to use, really. So I'm probably going to mix some of all of them together. And then I'm going to splash the water, spl splash the paint into the water first. Some nice big splotches. This is the way to do it. Nice mess for a, an afternoon of. I'm worried I'm coming down with a cold. I hope not. I don't know how I can have called cold because I haven't been anywhere near anyone for ages. But I feel as if I'm getting a sore throat. So send me your good vibrations, please, people. We did something like this before, didn't we? With um, when we were doing what was it? Um, did a laburnum tree earlier on in the year, and in the summer, and we did wisteria. That was it. We need some paper towel. Yeah, I should have stretched this paper, but I ran out of time. So I'm going to try to reinforce the colour here and I'm going to say to myself, this is the centre of one tree and then the other one is going to be over here, not quite so dark. So, I think I'm going to have to let that dry. And then um, I think what I might do, I might mix my media here. I'm not sure how this is going to work, but I'm going to try. This is a Karat Aquarelle uh, Stettler watercolor pencil. 
and I'm going to draw in two of the paint and see what happens. I want to see what's going to happen because um, if I put ink there, then I'm stuck if it runs too much. But this is just to give me an idea. And that is going to run. But the question is, does that matter? Or is that a good thing? So as I've said before, my studio is a kind of experimental place where you start out with one idea and you might very well end up doing something completely different. And this is quite exciting to use because it does bleed out. No, that's not the right thing to say. I've been watching too much Law and Order. Again, um, it bleeds. It just bleeds. It doesn't bleed out, Diane. It bleeds and it um, makes interesting textures. So we might not even need to use the ink after all, at all. Sometimes I like to hold Instead of, this is the traditional proper way to hold a pencil, not like, I don't know, like that. But when, sometimes when you're sketching, it's useful to hold it from above. And so not like that, and not like this, or whatever it is that some of these young people do. I can't even do it with my fingers. Not like that, that's, that's very controlling, very controlled um, in one way, so good for pen and brush. But if you want to sketch, sometimes holding it from above like that is good. So then you can, I don't know, it's, it gives a different effect. You could do a lot of this. Now, I'm not going to be using the ink after all. What I will be doing, though, is bringing a little bit of more water into this area here, just to make that look more like bark. And uh, it's possible that when that's dry, I might come in with a bit more pencil there, or maybe even ink. So it's just a case of waiting and seeing.
it's possible you might want to put a bit more colour in over some of the branches. possible this might benefit from a bit of salt too so let's put some of that on this is coarse coarse salt not salt coarse Okay, so that looks pretty horrendous, but on the other hand, you never know. And if nothing else, it's an experiment in colour. I'm just going to emphasize down one side of the branch of the trunk of this tree to give it a bit more form. And this one too, while it's still wet. Maybe still a few more spatters. Perhaps this one. Burnt sienna. This is to represent the leaves, of course. And you'll notice that this is the side that's got more yellow on it, quinacridone. This side is more pinkish. And uh, at this point, I am definitely going to stop and let that dry for two reasons. One, it's time to do that. And secondly, I need to visit the little girl's room. So I'll be back shortly when that's dry. Oh, I just wanted to show one other thing. When you're holding the uh, pencil like that, you can twist it just to make more variety in the stroke, the line for your branches. So if you just twist it, you'll get more 
knobbles and bits and pieces happening, not always the way you want them exactly, but so twisting. Like that. Okay, so this is dry now and I'm going to come in with a few more spatters for indicating the leaves. And there's two ways of doing spatters. You can either do it like that when you get sort of lengthwise kind of effect, or you can do it like that. And then you get more of a droplet kind of effect, so like that. I think I had a little bit too much there perhaps, so I'll just lift a little bit of that out. And make sure we put more orange on this side and more of a pinky one as we have already on that side. And I think the um, the lines of the structure of the tree are probably more or less good enough. The thing is, if I come in with that now, because it's dry, um, it won't give the same kind of, of effect as it was before. So if I want to reinforce any of the lines, the easiest way is just to come in with some ink. And I can also spatter, I'm not sure if that will work, but I can spatter with a brush um, if I want to get some black. I'll find the right brush in a minute. Yeah. There we are. Some black dots. Perhaps a few big ones. So you could call this a loose tree. That wouldn't be unreasonable. Trees are very complicated and people always come unstuck. The one thing that I think is the most useful thing to remember about when you're doing branches on trees is that they divide and every time they divide they get narrower so um, and what they don't do is at the bottom they don't splay out I've seen a lot of those so that's probably enough black and uh, so I'll put my lid back on if I can find it there it is you could spatter some white on there as well, but I don't think I'm going to bother with that. So I'm going to leave that now to dry. And uh, probably when it's dry, I'm going to call it done. Okay, so today what we're going to do is we're going to paint another autumnal scene. And uh, I've done the sketch ahead of time. You can download this from the website if you go to dianenton.com free of charge. And um, this is a fairly complex um, drawing so I didn't want to spend too long doing that uh, on video so I've done that ahead of time um, but what I have done is I have um, been looking at colors and thinking about how to paint this and I'm going to be aiming for a slightly <clears throat> less strident um, palette today we're going to I don't want to go too pastel because I think pastels aren't appropriate for this time of year at all uh, that's more springtime but something a little bit more muted, a little bit more on the, um, uh, well, on the pastel side, but not really going into pastels completely. So it's not going to be colorless. And I'm going to be using some of my Daniel Smith um, colors that I got the other day and principally jadeite, which is this green here, which swatches out like that. Um, I found that that blends quite nicely with um, 
uh, here you can see it with quinacridone gold and um, burnt sienna and gives a kind of mild, mild autumn glow, let's say. So we're aiming for something along those lines. And, um, and yeah, and I've put a few birds on here. And so we've basically got autumn leaves around the outside, the pumpkin in the middle and a few flowers and other things. And this may change as we go along. I might decide to alter it a bit, but we'll see what happens. Um, I've got my draw well brush here. This is a number seven round and I'm going to probably use that principally today. And I've got, as well as the jadeite green, I've got cobalt blue. Um, this is Van Dyke brown, which is a nice brown, which we're bound to need somewhere or other. Um, we've got burnt sienna. This is um, alizarin crimson, I think. Um, could be any pink or red. This is quinacridone gold. And I probably will need black, so I can use my Daniel Smith color here. This one is called... What is it called? They've got such weird names. Um, hematite, that is, but it's basically black. So I'll use that on the chickadees. And um, yeah, what else? Lost track of what I was thinking. It's that kitten. He distracts me. Never mind. Um, right, so let's start. And I'm working on a piece of Etival, Clairefontaine Etival paper, which is cellulose, but it's been sized accordingly so that it works well for wet in wet or um, dry on wet. Either way, it works. Um, yeah, you have to be careful about your paper, don't you? Because, well, the paper makes or breaks it. The paints you can play around with, the brushes you can play around with. You could paint with your fingers if you wanted to, but if you paint on poor paper, you're never going to get a good result. So I'm just dropping in some quinacridone gold there as a starting point. And i will put in a bit of uh, burnt sienna and let that run. And um, rather than wasting paint and letting that um, go to waste, I'm going to paint the next one in burnt sienna. And then I'll drop in, I don't know, why don't we drop in a bit of green and see what happens there. And just let that blend. Then I've got some green on my um, brush. So we'll pop that in there. And to give that a bit more life, we'll add a bit more quinacridone and let that blend too. And then in order to do the, um, the stem, you could, there's several different ways you could do that. You could pick up a, a rigger and you could drag the color back like that. You don't necessarily have to follow your initial lines. You could do that, that's quite effective. You're gonna get some variety in your colors there. And then you're going to want to put in your veins in the leaves. So you could use um, your um, glass pen. You could use a twig or the corner of a credit card cut up. I suggest Ikea cards, they're very good for that. I've never used an Ikea card for anything else. Anyway, um, so yes, so here we go. And you're gonna get some nice veins like that. Um, and then we're just gonna carry on in the same way going around. Um, okay, here we have an oak leaf. So we'll just do the start off with quinacridone gold. And sometimes you'll find that your drawing doesn't quite suit your purpose and you might decide to change the arrangement a little bit. And I'm going to pop in some burnt sienna and a um, little bit of maybe a little bit of dark brown here because the, um, the acorn needs to have something behind it to make it stand out. Uh, so we'll let that spread as well. Put in our veins and draw through that color and you're going to get something quite nice. You can pull it up as well. You could pull the color with your pen and use it like ink, like that. And let that spread. I won't do the acorn until that's dry a little bit because it will all bleed. And then change the tone a little bit and we'll come in with some of this, uh, what did I say that was called, this green? Who can remember? 
Was it jadeite? Jadeite, that was it. And um, we will add to that quinacridone gold, maybe? See how that turns out. The fun of this is just literally, you know, enjoying it really. When you scratch in the veins, if you scratch into very wet paint, nothing will happen. If you scratch into paint that's starting to dry, you'll get a darker line. And if you scratch into paint that's almost dry, you'll get a um, a light vein. So if you vary the time that you do it, you'll get a variety of different results. I'll do this acorn here and do the cup and then the uh, actual acorn itself. But I won't do that one yet. Okay, so up here we've got some berries. So I'm going to pick up some pink. And because we're going for a little bit of a muted, slightly more muted, we will do the berries in pink rather than red, I think. And these leaves I'm going to do in a combination of jadeite and um, this pink, which is, I think, I don't know, what is that? I think, oh no, that's potter's pink, right. Yeah, good colour. Aren't they pretty, these leaves? Look. If you decide to, to go outside of your original drawing lines, that's fine, isn't it? Because you just do that and then afterwards when it's completely dry you just rub out the pencils lines and uh, you'll be fine um, so I think I'll do the that stem I think I better do that with a pen a uh, brush Now here we have a chickadee, so we will drop some black, and this is the Daniel Smith hematite, which is going to give me a soft black, not a dark black by the look of it, so we pop that in there, and then I'm going to simplify the, the body of the bird a little bit, I don't think we need to go into too much detail. So we'll do that and his um, chest is pink, isn't it? A pinkish beige colour. So we'll just do that. And stick his legs in there. This is a watercolour pencil and I'm just using the watercolour pencil to just add the details of his eye, some sort of feathery appearance to his head like that, which we can make darker if we wet it, this particular pencil. It puts the dark where you really want it. So for example, the legs you can emphasize the black on there. You can emphasize the tail as well. 
So like that. When that's dry, you can rub out the pencil that you don't want. Okay, now I'm going to wet the area of the pumpkin. I'm going to do the pumpkin next. So I'm just going around the um, flowers and the leaves that are going to be in front of the pumpkin. So I just do that. And then I'm going to pick up a bit of jadeite. First of all, I'm going to drop that in. And then we're going to go for a bit of canacridone. And where that mixes with the jadeite, it obviously makes it into much more of a natural sort of colour. And then I think we'll go for a bit of this pink and a bit of burnt sienna. And we just let that mix and mingle and then that's the first coat and we can always intensify that if we need to afterwards. Next step. Um, now we've got a little robin up here and I'm just going to give him a pink chest. And then robins have a little touch of blue just here and then they go sort of brown. So some Van Dyke brown this is, or sepia, or burnt umber, or any of those kinds of colors. Right, and if that turns out too pale for you, you can always strengthen that up a bit. Okay, so now um, we want to, I think this is a beech leaf up here, this one. So we'll come in with the acanacridone again, and then the typical beech colour. And a dash of brown. And just drag the colour out a little bit to give yourself a bit of a serrated edge. Oh good, it's raining again. This one is just jadeite. It's a nice soft colour. I find it quite hard to go away from the real colours of things. So you're going to find I always tend to go back to my favourite colours, which are more realistic. You know, a lot of people, they paint grey leaves and things, but I don't know if I can genuinely appreciate that. I mean, it's aesthetically, good but now we have a sort of maple here something like that so I'm going to do that in um, shades of pink I think some pink some burnt sienna and some quinacridone gold and then we'll carry the quinacridone on down to this one
And then um, let's do this. Uh, I quite liked this pink with the jadeite, I think. Although that is a little on the grey side, I think I can tolerate that. You just need something like that to sort of offset the orange of the, the fall colored leaves, I think. So we'll do these ones in, I think this is Potter's Pink, or it could be Piemontite, as in the Daniel Smith. I'm gonna stick some green in there and let that Mix and mingle. We'll do this one as well in the same kind of way. And then we have a, oh gosh, now what kind of leaf is this? Mm, it's not maple. Is it sycamore? I need Tamsin to tell me what these leaves are, but she's busy. So, Conacridone Gold and then Burnt Sienna. Same over here, burnt sienna and quinacridone gold the other way around. have another robin here so we'll do the same kind of thing the pink for the breast we can save all our robin red breasts for Christmas these ones are a little bit more um, stylized said before mix and mingle okay a little bit of um, pink Piemont Piuet whatever um, for these uh, what do you call them oh god it'll come to me I'm quite liking this um, jadeite green mixed with the Piemontite pink. You know, as if there aren't enough new words to learn when it comes to using YouTube and computers and things. I mean, we have conversations where I say things like, can you just put the thing me what's it on the doobry because I can't find the what's it and and we know what we mean because I mean all these words that you're supposed to know things like you know YouTube <laughs> channels memberships it's all so complicated well 
not only complicated, but it's just badly named a lot of the time. So if you ever have any problems understanding what I'm talking about, do, don't hesitate to ask, because I probably don't understand what I'm saying either. But together we might be able to sort it out. Definitely not. Okie dokie. So here we have some uh, stalks of corn or something like that. I'll go back to the jadeite. And we get a nice green if you mix that with and gold. some more oak leaves here. Our oaks don't go brown until December at the earliest, so I'm having to imagine oaks. It's quite strange. I'm pretty sure that in England, where obviously I used to live, they were going brown sooner. But actually in Brittany, because we're that much further south, a lot of things don't even really go brown, they just fall off. Okay, let's uh, pick up some of this Piemontite or whatever it's called and do some roses. Winter roses. We've got quite a lot of roses in flower at the moment. Surprising, isn't it? I'm going to make these three different shades of sort of neutral pinky brown colour. Somebody remarked that I had lots of holes in my hands because was I playing with the cat? Oh no, the cat plays with me. <laughs> He's lovely, cuddly, gentle, beautiful, huggy, huggy, and then all of a sudden he plunges his teeth into you and won't let go. It's like something out of Star Trek. It's quite bizarre. Well, you probably don't know what the hell I mean when I say something out of Star Trek, but you know, like some kind of alien grabbing onto you. That's what it feels like. Okay, so now we have the other um, chickadee down here. So we put this hematite for his head and his, oh, I forgot the little chest bit here, didn't I, on that one? It's the trouble when you haven't actually seen a particular bird, you're working from photos all the time. It's uh, sometimes it's very easy to make a mistake.
So we'll put a bit more green up here. And add some water and let that blend down a bit. And then a bit more quinacridone gold. And bring that round here a little bit. And then a bit of burnt sienna on that side. Then we need to let that dry a bit and then we can put some shadows in for the, the shape of the uh, pumpkin. And put some berries in there and then I think I have more or less covered most things with paint, so we need to leave that for a bit to dry. When we come back and do the next step, I don't think there'll be much more to do. This one I forgot to, I forgot to scratch in the vein, so I'll do that with a brush. Definitely an option. Okay, so time to let that dry. Okay, so that's more or less dry now. <clears throat> so I'm just going to um, uh, pick up a slightly darker shade of this green that I've used on this side of the pumpkin and uh, draw in a line and then just come in and soften that line. And then with any luck, we'll get something that looks a bit like a shadow and gives a kind of impression of those ribs that um, that pumpkins have. And then as we go along, obviously, we're going to change the colour. And uh, because here we were using quinacridone and here we were using burnt sienna. So just change that as we go along and then come back with your brush with no paint on it, just a little bit of water and just soften that up. Let that bleed in a little bit and uh, see how that looks after that's dry. And if you want to do some more, you can do a little bit more. Uh, maybe a few little bits of brown on the stem there, but not too much because you don't want it too contrasty. I've remembered what that was called. That's called honesty. And um, that's what that's called. So we'll just put a little bit of shadow on there, on those. And then you want to work your way around the painting, um, just uh, adding the final details like the little beaks and the eyes on the birds, and you can do that with pencil if you want, or you can use pen. If you use a pencil, you know that you can always rub it out. This robin seems to have turned into a chaffinch, so that's okay. It looks very much more chaffinchy than he does robin -y, so, you know, a little bit of metamorphosis is fine. This one, however, does look like a robin. Um, and we have our chickadees down here. They need sharpening up on the eyes. And the shape, you can modify the shape a little bit using a pencil. This one looks okay. And uh, some of the stems have disappeared, so we need to just replace those, like these here, and some <coughs> stalks for the berries. Um, some of them I didn't put the veins in, so we'll do that. And just these little bits of contrast, which I think is quite nice to do with a watercolour pencil. That just livens things up a bit. You could use, obviously, a Stettler um, fine liner or something like that too. But I do quite like using the pencil because as I say, if it's too much, you can rub it out. And it's a sort of soft, a little bit softer, isn't it? A bit of a softer kind of effect. Gives that sharpness, but without being too in your face. I 
Um, this is a good opportunity while I'm doing this. I just want to recap the uh, the membership thing. Um, you might like to become a member and support the channel on a regular basis. Um, you can sign up on the um, on the channel. Uh, just go to press the join button when you go to the our home page and it will give you all the information on the different levels and how to sign up. It's quite straightforward. If you sign up as a relax member, that's the lowest one, that's only $2.99 a month. And you get uh, the loyalty badges, you get the emojis, <clears throat> which are increasing in number as they allow us to have more, we can have more. And you get to vote when we have a poll for the next subject or a subject upcoming that we're going to paint. And from time to time, there are outtakes and and uh, extra footage. That's kind of as and when kind of thing that doesn't happen on a regular basis. Then if you sign up for Breathe, it's $4.99, you get all of the previous ones I mentioned. Plus you can join the private Facebook group, which is quite nice because there you get to chat with other members and share your work and get feedback and all that kind of thing. But it's a very small group and it's meant to be a very small group so that it's much more personalized. And I will be popping in there uh, from time to time and um, commenting and and uh, chatting and so on and so forth. Whereas with the big group, um, Learn to Paint, Watercolor, that's not really possible anymore. We've got 25,000 members there, so that's a bit of an unwieldy size. I think 30, 40 members is a much more sensible thing. Um, and then if you, and you get a monthly free gift as well, which, um, is usually a digital download. Last month it was um, coloring book. And then for Create and Paint, which is the third level, $8.99, um, you get everything from the previous levels, plus you get a discount on any merchandise you buy from our site. And um, once every three months you can send me one of your paintings and I'll do a critique on it for you. So that's what you get for that. So we would be very happy to have you on board and join us with... Um, with uh, as a member and um, we did a live yesterday as well which is the sort of thing that um, you can participate in whether or not you're a member and uh, don't think that this means the fact that we've got the membership um, that we won't be continuing to produce videos nothing's changing this is just an additional feature some people think that uh, you have to join in order to see the videos but that's definitely not the case So I think we're probably coming to the end now. Um, that looks like that could do a little bit more of a vein there. And um, I'm just going to pencil in. There used to be a painter called um, Mads Stanger, I think his name was. He was Scandinavian, I think, Danish or Swedish. And he did lovely um, watercolor sketches of animals. And he always used a, a lot of pencil as well. A pencil was a feature of his drawings, and I've often tried to emulate that a little bit. I think pencil and watercolour go together probably better than pen. Except that's, you know, pen and wash. But if you're doing a proper painting like this one, then pencil is a better, a better option, I think. I'm not very sure I like this particular rose. I think I made a nice mess of that, but never mind. I know you'll forgive me. Okie dokie. So there we are. Today is going to be a bit of a fungal day. We're going to be doing a little bit of uh, work on mushrooms, I think, which is such a fun thing to paint and to draw as well. And here I've got I've got some cards here that I've been painting, um, and uh, I'm trying to do a little bit of something for everybody. So I have um, first of all, I want to say I was painting these cards on some paper, which surprised me about how wonderful it is. And I haven't yet looked it up to see whether you can still buy this, but this is a box of greetings cards that I bought a very long time ago. It's by a company called Royal Langnickel, 
It's got an English address on it, but it says made in China. So I'm guessing that if they are still available, they'll be on Amazon. So if you want to look for those, I'll put the link, I'll try and find a link and I'll put it in the description below because they are really nice card. Now, who knows what's available now, but um, at this time, this has got a lovely texture, as you can probably see. And um, I was just trying out some wet in wet and I used, for this little sketch, I just used um, cobalt blue and um, potter's pink. And um, can you see the granulation that came up here? Which is so perfect for mushrooms. And then I did it again on another type of paper, which was, um, this is my Baohong pad, which I did the landscape on yesterday. And the, um, there was a bit of a back run here, which I didn't really want, but look at the granulation of the pink. The potter's pink produces a texture which is absolutely perfect for mushrooms. And here you can see the granulation, it's coming away from the blue that it was mixed into. So you're getting some really lovely effects. The same thing here. The cobalt blue is granulating here into um, burnt sienna. So if you want texture in your paintings, you don't have to buy special paints really, um, because you'll get texture if you just add a little bit of potter's pink or cobalt blue to whatever it is that you're mixing up. And it makes some lovely soft greys. Um, by, on, in contrast, um, we've got these ones, which I think are great fun. I did these actually with um, brush pens. Um, with paint inside them. So I have a set of uh, 96 um, uh, different colours and I did it with that. But the reason I did that really was to just try out some different designs because it's quite quick to do. And uh, I thought maybe we might try painting something along these lines with real paint. So just to show you what you can do with those brush pens, if you feel that way inclined, they're quite fun. They are quite fun to use. I quite like that, but it's not really what you might call proper watercolour painting, is it? But still, a good way to try out different designs. Then um, I thought, I think I better actually think about how mushrooms really are constructed. So I went to my book of the English countryside, British countryside, um, the AA book that a few of you have bought. I think you've managed to find copies of this online and that's absolutely great because the Book of the British Countryside by the AA published in 1970 something and there are these marvellous pictures here that have been painted by some experts many years ago uh, showing how mushrooms are constructed and I would like to just quickly demonstrate how easy it is to draw a mushroom and how much fun because you can make them up but if you start off with uh, examples of what they really look like you'll find um, your imagination will be sparked, but it's a good idea to start with the, the real thing. So the easiest way is to draw a mushroom. You start with, just make sure you can see it, yes. You start with the stem or the stalk, which is just two parallel lines getting slightly wider at the bottom. They're all like that. Most of them have got some kind of a bulge at the bottom, but you don't necessarily see that because usually that's underground but that's what holds them in and they have their little roots down here. So that would be underground. But so your stem goes up like that. Now, very often they have a sort of frilly edge. So you might want to put that in and they don't all have that, but a lot of them do. And it's where the cap has separated from the stem. So then the best way of drawing the cap is to actually do, if you're, if you're looking at it so that you can see the underneath, the easiest way is to just draw the underneath part as an oval like that. It doesn't have to be perfectly symmetrical. And then you can choose how high you want the cap to be. So let's say we went for a happy medium and then just curve that down like that. And lo and behold, you have something resembling a mushroom. Now they have gills underneath, which all go to the center. So you can just draw radiating lines like that coming out from the, the center. And if you want, you can put some spots on. And then down here, we might want to put some grasses. You might want to draw something like a fern or whatever coming out here. Or you might just want to leave it very simple. Oh, 
Why can you never find an eraser when you want one? La -di -da -di -da. A whole big pot of erasers, but I can't find one now. Anyway, never mind. I was just going to rub that bit out, but I won't bother because I can't find it. Now, if you wanted to do one that was facing you, that's easier still. So you just draw your stem. Like a tree, they just come out a little bit at the bottom, like that. And then you might want to probably start from the top, come down and then just go round. So it's like a triangle really, but rounded off all round. And then, because they curve like that, so you can indicate the curve just by doing, doing that. And then often they have a little baby sister growing beside them, a smaller one, usually with a more closed up cap. So you would do that like that. And what I would suggest is that you practice, you could put the frill on here afterwards if you wanted to. You practice drawing a few and getting different shapes going until you feel comfortable and then you can plan a design. So here's one that's on a long, tall stem with a little round hat and another similar thing beside it like that. And away you go. Once you start drawing these things, you won't be able to stop. And I do honestly heartily suggest that you try drawing them because if your drawing skills are un, as yet un, undeveloped, you will probably, you could do a lot worse than to start off by drawing mushrooms. Make sure you've got something to use as a, even if it's a, a mushroom from the fridge, you know, uh, try to draw from life or from a good photograph. And I'm going to do one with a, one of those funny Mexican hat type things here. It goes up in the middle like that. Okay, so that's how you draw a mushroom. Now to do this painting, I'm going to have a limited palette. I don't believe in mixing up my colors before I start. I like to let them mix and mingle on the paper so that we get a much more um, lively effect. Uh, I don't like to be inhibited by having pre-mixed colors. And one of the reasons for that is that if you mix up some greys, you're going to have lots of different colours in those greys. So when you mix the greys together, then you might have six or seven different pigments. For example, if you have a grey that you've pre-mixed and you've mixed it with green and brown to make grey, you've got green and that's already got blue and yellow in it. And if you've mixed green with brown to make grey, the brown has already got red and green in it. So your grey might have red and green and blue and yellow and... Um, all those colours, multiple colours, and then you mix it with another grey, so you could end up with 12 different pigments in one colour. This is redundant. Okay, so the way I do it, I start with basically the primaries. The green is very much an option, which speeds things up a bit, but we have blue and we have essentially a red. Potter's pink is basically a red. Then I use burnt sienna, which is another red, and gold, which quinacridone gold, and with those colours, I can mix lots of greys. So that's all you need really. Potter's pink for the granulation, cobalt blue rather than ultramarine because um, depending on the ultramarine that you've got, it may or may not granulate. I've got one here that doesn't granulate. Usually it does or it used to. French ultramarine doesn't seem to. Um, so cobalt blue is what I suggest. I like the blue of cobalt blue better because it's more delicate. So I think I've been wittering on long enough and someone will tell me off for not doing any painting before very long, won't they? So I better get started. So I've drawn out a little quick sketch here of a few mushrooms with a few leaves and things like that. And I'm going to have a go now at painting them. And um, I've got the paints I mentioned earlier here and I found my rubber 
eraser and I'm using a round number five because this is fairly small. Uh, I don't normally paint this small, but I decided to do it in this little sketchbook and that's the way it turned out. So we're going to paint more or less fairly at random. I'm going to try and do this reasonably loose. I know that this particular paper is fairly, um, uh, it, it requires you to paint loosely. So I'm going to do a very uh, loose undercoat and I'm going to let the colors blend. And then when that's dry and we've got all of our granulation and everything happening, then um, I can put in a few details. So uh, I painted that one there in Potter's Pink and Cobalt Blue and I'm just going to let that all blend. And then I'm going to do um, Potter's Pink on this one. This is uh, a sort of, <clears throat> it's called a shaggy, what's it called? A shaggy ink cap, I think. And it has kind of scales that stick out. So we'll put those in afterwards. And I'm doing this one, I'm doing the stem in blue, bluish. <clears throat> this one I'll make a little bit of a gray. So I'm mixing the potter's pink with blue, using plenty of water. And then this one um, has got spots on it and it's a soft red. So I think I'll do it in a mixture of burnt sienna and blue. Um, so I'll just drop that in and then underneath that's it's going to be grey again. So we'll use blue. If you feel you've dropped in too much, you can always lift it out with a with a thirsty brush. And pop in the stem. And then this one, I think will give him a nice gray stem and also his little sister there. And some of them, some of the more poisonous ones have got quite pinkish underneath. So we'll do that there. And then I'm going to use Potter's Pink thinner for the top. And hopefully that will blend. And a bit of cobalt blue. These ones I'm going to do in grey. So cobalt blue basically, with a touch of Potter's Pink. Okay, so now that needs to, oh I've missed one down there haven't I? We'll just do that one in a little subtle grey there. Then I've got some leaves and some acorns. <coughs> so um, an oak leaf so we'll do that yellow to start with and then I'll drop in some burnt sienna and this one is a beech leaf so we'll start that one off with burnt sienna and then we've got a um, <clears throat> acorn, so that will need a fairly dark colour for the cap, uh, yeah, the cup, cup, not cap. Another oak leaf. Beach, another beech leaf there. Acorn. 
acorn cup. And then maybe we want a little bit of green for this ferny thing. And then some various greens and things for grasses. Growing up in between. Try not to get too pernickety about all of that. It always looks better if you can just just relax and let it kind of just happen. Okay, that's nearly dry. So I'm going to come back in here with some more potter's pink and just drop that in loosely. And we need to let it dry so that we can then put the gills in underneath once that's dry. So this is dry now and I'm just going to add a few shadows um, underneath, indicate some of the gills and uh, increase the amount of shadow right close to the stem. And you can use a, a light wash of cobalt blue for this. Doesn't matter what the colour is underneath, because cobalt blue will just act as a shadow colour. Wherever you want it, we don't need too much. Don't want to spoil things. It's just a very light little sketch with a little bit of character. And uh, I think that's probably about it. Um, I've put in a few um, grasses using a rigger and just add one or two more. And uh, some dark spots using um, a mixture of um, cobalt blue, clinacridone gold and a touch of um, olive green there, just one or two, just one or two, literally one or two, because this is a very small little painting, so you don't want to do too much in the way of detail. So generally kind of indicate the, the leaves on the forest floor with a few dashes, this and that. Emphasize the sh sh shagginess of the uh, what's it called again? Shaggy ink cap. Thank you. 
I'm going to call that a day. Let's say this painting is finished. So today I've been thinking about painting leaves and um, I'm going to show you um, some techniques uh, of painting autumn leaves that we, I don't know if we've done them before, I don't think so. Um, and uh, we won't be using a lot of colours, but um, we will be using some masking fluid. So if you haven't got any of that, um, maybe you might want to try and get hold of some. And I'm just sticking this piece of paper down to my board. Um, I'm using this piece of paper because um, I don't know why really. I could be using a stretched piece. Uh, that probably would be sensible. But um, I'm not. So anyway, there we are. Um, so I am going to draw some leaves. Um, a maple leaf, perhaps. And um, a couple of maple leaves, perhaps. Um, maple leaves have kind of uh, a pointy thing like this going on, I think. You have to forgive me if you feel I've got it wrong because um, we don't have them here and I'm using the photograph to draw from. So it's got sort of like pointy bits. There we are. And uh, another, perhaps another pointy bit there. And then they have veins. They have one vein that goes down the middle and then one to each of those pointy bits. And that's that. And um, we could have another one. We could have another one over here. Maybe a smaller one up here. The hardest thing about any painting really is the idea and the composition, I think. And uh, I've never been terribly confident myself about composition. Um, so I know that's the hard bit really. Once you've got some ideas, then uh, that's one of the reasons why I do a lot of very random stuff because it kind of grows. And the, the courage comes from actually having the nerve to get started. I do find that that's a still, even after all these years, that getting up the nerve to actually put a, paper, uh, put a pencil to paper is uh, quite hard. You just don't, I don't know, do you, is it because you don't want to waste your time or you don't want to disappoint yourself? Or, I don't know really. Anyway, so um, I'm kind of trying to blend the idea of Thanksgiving and Christmas here. So I'm, I'm putting some pine needles in the background and then these, um, these, um, maple leaves in as well and they're obviously going to be on the golden brown kind of color now i need to find my masking fluid um, i've got daniel smith artist masking fluid here and um, what i'm going to do is to save diluting it Going to tip some of it out onto a bowl, onto a little dish like that, and then I'm going to use an old brush to apply the masking fluid with. 
and you put it on uh, quite thickly, ideally, so that you can get it off again. Um, you can't do this on a very thin paper. This is, I'm using Etival Clairefontaine here, which should be fine when it comes to pulling the masking off. But don't try and do it on sketching paper, anything like cartridge paper, it won't work. So I'm just uh, more or less, probably less rather than more accurately following my sketch. Um, you can download the sketch, which I'll make from the final painting. Uh, you can download that from the website dianeanton.com for free if you want. All my sketches are up there for you and you can just help yourself. Um, oh yes, and I was going to mention about the, the website. There's a blog on the website as well and every few days I... Every day I put up a blog and occasionally I write something a little bit more detailed. And there is a, a page there about um, choosing your paints and why and what kind you probably would benefit from most. And um, so if you want to read up on which colors to choose or what brand to choose, it's uh, there's quite a bit of information there. Okay, so they are now pretty much covered with uh, masking fluid. If I've made any, if I've missed any bits, it probably won't matter too much. And what I'm gonna try and do when I've, um, after I've done the background and I start to paint the leaves, I'm gonna try and paint some water droplets on these leaves because that always looks very impressive and I um, I expect you'll be quite interested to see that. Okay, so I need to rinse out my brush and I will go and wash that because um, the masking fluid damages the bristles on the brush, not as much as it used to when there was ammonia. Was it ammonia? Yes, it used to smell of ammonia. Used to work a lot better then too, but now they've made it more ecologically sound and um, doesn't work as well. But anyway, these things are sent to try us. So that's going to dry. And uh, meanwhile, I'll probably go and have lunch. Um, the colors I'm going to use to start with for the background will be um, burnt sienna, quinacridone gold and um, olive green, or something along those lines, whatever you have that's similar and then whoops then we're going to have a, a sort of greenish brown background then I will remove no then I'm going to scratch in um, these um, pine needles and then we will take off the masking fluid and then we'll paint the leaves so that's what we're going to do and I hope it's going to work do you like my washi tape it's quite nice and pink isn't it nice and girly um, okay, so I have to let that dry. Um, that's going to take probably an hour or so. Okay, so back soon. Okay, so I am suitably refreshed with my lunch and my coffee, and I think this is probably dry enough now to um, go in and paint the background. So I've got my, I've got four colours here now, actually. I decided that I would add um, Van Dyke Brown or you could use burnt umber or um, any dark brown, really. Um, I want to use that because I'm going to reserve the burnt sienna for the leaf, the leaves themselves. So this is the brown I'm going to use in the background mixed in with some olive green. And these two colours I'm going to use for the leaves, as well as perhaps some of that. Um, now, I'm going to put this paint on fairly thickly because the way I'm going to do these um, pine needles is I'm going to do the scraping out technique and for this I have a very expensive tool here which is very hard to come by um, you're going to have to pay a lot for this actually um, so I don't know if all of you will be able to afford it 
What it is, it's a um, family card from Ikea that I've cut in half and I've trimmed off the ends. So I've got one end that's pointed, sharp, and then a couple of other ends which are slightly less sharp. And you can always modify those by cutting it again to a slightly different angle. And you can use it to scrape into the paint to give um, a lighter area where it scrapes away the paint. Um, in order to make that work though, you do need to use a fair amount of pigment. Otherwise, it, it just doesn't make the indentations that you need. Plus you need to do it at the right moment because if it's too dry, it won't work. And if it's too wet, it won't work. So that's the, uh, that's the skill involved with that. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and I'm just looking for a pair of scissors because I'm just going to show how you can modify the shape here. So if you just, that's a little bit too wide, I think. So I'm just going to cut it down a bit like that. And then I'm hoping I'm going to be able to scrape out some, some nice shapes. So before I do that, probably I ought to practice. It's always a good idea, isn't it? So I'm going to pop a bit of um, paint to try it with dark brown on here. Make it quite nice and brown. Um, something else to remember is that when, if you're doing a, a background and you want to make it nice and strong, then don't use too much water and don't do it wet in wet because if you do it wet in wet, you'll get some lovely subtle blends, but you will lose a lot of color. Now, when this is still very wet and you scrape into it, what happens is you get a darker line as the pigment flows into the indentation. If you wait a little while, and it, uh, it might not be all that long, but um, just wait a little while and try again, and then you'll find that you get light lines, and both of those are useful for this process. So it doesn't matter if some of them are light and some of them are dark. And you can see it's starting to dry. So you're starting to get a white line. So we'll wait a little bit longer. Meanwhile, you can look at my efforts at um, water droplets there. I, uh, I'll show you how to do those shortly. Let's see what happens now. Yeah, it's getting lighter. That means it's drying, sinking in. So how long's that been? About 30 seconds. So I think probably that amount of paint, I'm going to have to wait about a minute for it to start to dry before I can really scratch out. Yeah, a good minute. There we are, that's the look I'm after. Like that. So when the time comes, you need to go in there and get scratching. Make a good hedgehog, wouldn't it? Look at that. So there we are. And, uh, credit card or Ikea card is perfect for that. So I'll pop that over there and uh, now I'm going to use my um, cat's tongue brush, my Zen Art faux squirrel nylon, in other words, um, black tulip brush. And um, what I'm thinking is we'll keep the corners a little bit lighter, with some light areas, and then we'll have some dark areas as well, especially in the middle and around the large leaves. So I'm hoping this is going to be um, dry enough. So we'll mix up a very dark green and just brush that in. Just make sure you cover all of the um, all of the paper, especially around the edges. And um, I'm just going to drop in some burnt sienna as well down here, just to 
warm it up a bit because as I'm going along I'm thinking as you often do when you start these things you think to yourself oh I know what I just said I was going to do but that doesn't have actually anything to do with what I'm actually going to do it's a bit like cooking really I don't know how many times I go into the kitchen with the intention I'll say something like I have no idea what we're going to eat tonight and then Tamsin will say, I don't know how you managed to think of that. How do you manage to come up with these ideas? I'm like, I don't know. I'll just look in the fridge and see what's in there. And then just put it together in a random fashion, a bit like I do in my paintings. Someone said she liked my devil may care attitude towards painting. I think that sums it up. <laughs> right. So there we are, that's all of that. And now, of course, I can't see where I had my, um, what do you call them? So I'll just have to make that all up. scratching noise. <coughs> so that just kind of gives a nice texture. And you can um, remember the stems as well, which I painted over. I did that, actually did that on purpose for once. Okay, so now we need to let that dry too. Okay, so this is dry now, so I have to now do the bit that... Uh, we don't necessarily enjoy all that much, which is to rub off the masking fluid. And we, of course we have to be careful so that we make sure that we don't rip the paper. And uh, so that piece came off okay, so that's not too bad. Um, so I'm just going to continue with that. And uh, I'll see you back here in a minute once I've rubbed all of this off. Okay, so I have now rubbed off all of the masking fluid and I'm going to come in with some quinacridone gold and make that the first coat of these maple leaves. And I'm going to put that in fairly wet and it doesn't really matter if it goes over into the background and it doesn't matter if it's not particularly even because we want a, what you might call slightly random effect so we'll do that and then I'm going to pick up some burnt sienna and I'm going to drop that in too wherever I feel like it just in bits and pieces and then some burnt umber around and about Same thing, plenty of quinacridone gold. Burnt sienna. It's just another way of applying it. You can do it bit by bit like this.
For something like this, you want to make sure that the paint that you're using is going to uh, lift. In other words, you want it to be possible to um, take some of the paint off of the paper so that you can do the droplets if you want to have a go at the droplets. And the last one down here. If you want to make some areas a bit darker, just once it's started to dry a little bit, you can add a little bit more. And you could also add some green too. If you really want to make some dark areas, adding some olive green to the brown will help with that. And now we need to let that dry. I might do a bit of spatter on there. I might put some uh, quinacridone gold into those leaves. Perhaps a bit of burnt sienna. I might put a bit more green also into the background. Yeah, and now we do need to let that dry. Now the painting's dry and um, we're going to look at putting one or two water drops on here. So you want to go for the areas where it's darkest really. Um, and then just with a uh, damp brush, just basically make a circle and wet the paint in a sort of circular shape and blot it out <clears throat> and you'll get a very light area showing up straight away and that's where you're going to put your water drop. You can make it oval if you like or teardrop shape or round whatever. I'll make a few different ones and then Perhaps we'll put a, another little one next to it because it always looks more convincing when there's more than one. And if you've used good quality paper, reasonably good, it doesn't have to be pure cotton. In fact, if anything, you're better off with cellulose for a painting like this. Um, but you need paint that doesn't stain, so don't use any of the phthalo colours because they won't lift up. But you should be okay with burnt umber, burnt sienna, olive green, quinacridone gold. They all lift up as you can see. And just go over it a few times, just very lightly uh, wetting the paint till you can see that it's starting to lift and then dab it out with a piece of paper towel, like that. And you really, you could use a mask to do that. Um, I don't mean a medical mask, I mean a um, like a stencil. But you don't really need to because you'll find that a round shape will come up very readily. If you just do it like that. And you'll soon find that you get addicted to this very quickly. Let's put one up here, otherwise this one is going to be lonely. Don't want too many because we don't want it to look like it's got measles. But you see how white that 
looks once you've lifted that out a little bit. Okay, we could put another one on that one, but I'll just probably just do paint, paint one of them for you for illustration. And um, I'm just going to pop the hairdryer on there to dry those off. So once they're dry, now the easiest way of doing this is to look and see what colour you've got behind the water drop to be. And then pick up some paint. I need a tester here. It needs to be, and this is the wrong brush. Wrong brush. No good. A small brush. Need a small brush. Very small brush. Yes, one like this. This is one of my draw well rounds. This is a number one. Don't use a number one very often. So yeah, you need a fairly reasonable, decently dark. The same kind of colour that you've got behind. And then you're just going to emphasise the shadow. Sort of go three quarters of the way around like that. And make sure that you fade it off a little bit. And then um, on the top part, you need to leave one section really light and then you want um, a little bit of shadow on the other side. So don't go right to the edge, but just very lightly, only halfway across and vary it a bit. And then let it dry because um, you can't always tell how it's going to dry. And then if you want, you can put some white to lighten up the light area. You might or you might not need that. And then you need a little white highlight here. And then you have to let it dry and then you'll know whether or not it's worked. And if it hasn't, then you come back and you do it again. And for the one next to it that's much smaller, we probably don't need to do anything except just increase the shadow. need to be patient and let them dry. And you do probably need a fairly small brush. Thank you. 
Okay, so like I said, you need to let that dry and then we'll come back and take a look at that. Once they have dried. Um, now, one other thing I want to do just is to um, put in a few dark pine needles. So like either you could say they were shadows And then maybe behind some of these ones, you could just drop in a little bit more dark there, make them stand out a bit more. And then the other thing is, if you feel that the shape has gone a bit wonky, you can always just go in and sharpen up the points a little bit like this. So for those people who love to fiddle, this is perfect because this is where you actually need to fiddle. Okay, so I'm going to stop there for a minute and give it a bit of thought and then come back and we'll see where we're at. And that's pretty much it. I have added uh, a few spatters in uh, dark green and white. And um, this, uh, this washi tape's coming off quite nicely. It's always fun when you take the tape off and uh, you get a better idea then of what you've actually done. You could do much smaller ones of this uh, and make them into greetings cards or something like that for Thanksgiving. You could obviously do calligraphy over the top of it as well. And you can um, play around with the edges. You can lift if you feel that the shape's gone a little bit wrong. It's If you use these colours and um, uh, a decent kind of paper, you can always make adjustments. So don't let anyone tell you that if you um, paint watercolour, you can't ever correct anything, because that's not entirely true. It's a bit harder, perhaps, than it is with acrylic, but it can still be done. Today I'm going to start thinking about autumn properly now. It's, um, it's freezing cold here, and... Um, can't wait to get the air conditioning installed, that will make all the difference. Um, so anyway, I decided to do something with some warm colours. So I'm just sticking down a piece of paper onto my board here. This is um, Etival, Clairefontaine Etival paper, which is <clears throat> a cellulose paper, but you wouldn't know it, frankly. The only thing that would show up that it was not 100% cotton is the fact that you aren't going to go bankrupt using lots of it. So you see I've got a scarf on, it's cold. So I'm going to do something with some lovely warm colours this morning and first of all it's going to be really really loose and I'm going to use my larger uh, Kuretake water brush because I find I can control the water flow on the paper much more easily with this brush than with a regular watercolour brush for what I'm going to do. So first of all, I'm going to do a background. And this is a background that you can do when you don't know what you're going to do. Um, sometimes you come in, you stare at a piece of paper, you're like, I don't know what I'm going to paint. So don't just sit there staring at the piece of paper, put some paint on it. That's the thing to do. And um, I've got here my Viviva colour sheets, which are looking extremely tatty. 
and I'm going to have to get some more of these. For the time being, I'm kind of going to use them up. So I'm thinking autumn leaves, and this is going to be kind of background. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my colors, and I've got dusk orange, I've got vermilion, I've got burnt sienna, burnt umber, saffron, and I've got burgundy, and happy yellow, and tree bark brown. And those colors are going to be my autumn colors. The uh, burgundy is a pink that's going to just add some some light, some uh, warmth, some real sort of red tones. And this is going to be just a mixture of beautiful autumn shades. And I'm not going to mix them together. I'm going to just plonk them in, pick them up more or less at random off of my um, paper sheets and let them do their thing. And then after that, we will have a background, won't we? So just put water on your, um, on your um, paper, on your color sheet. Just squeeze out some water from the um, brush and then pick up some of the color, whatever color it is that's there. Just let, let the thing, whole thing go, um, go crazy, go crazy. Here we have some light yellow, that might be too light. I think I've pretty much exhausted that light yellow. Um, yeah, let's use this one. And the good thing about this paper is you'll get some back runs, you'll get some um, cauliflowers and lines and things, but on the whole, it, ble it blends and bleeds really nicely. Best thing is not to think too hard about what you're doing, just go with the flow. These paints don't dry a lot lighter. Like uh, most of the um, Winsor & Newton type, all of those regular paints, they all dry uh, lighter than they appear when they're wet, which is aggravating to say the least. Um, but these Viviva ones, because they're dye rather than paint, they, they don't. Um, also, I'm going to get some core paints. I, I've decided I'm going to try them because I think they have a different medium in them and because of that, they, um, they um, dry the same color as they are when you put them on, which is really useful. Now I'm looking for some yellow again here. I'm not sure if I can get much yellow out of this. I think we're getting towards the end. I'll be ordering some more soon. Doesn't matter what this looks like, just get the paint on there. Get some burgundy in here. I can get it to come off. There we are. This is a great way to start the day. I felt a bit woozy this morning. Don't know why, but uh, this has got the blood flowing. I have to let the kitten out in a minute. Okay, so that's that, that's good. I've got my pulse rate up and um, I'm going to chuck some salt on there. Fine salt, ordinary, ordinary uh, common or garden salt. And then I'm going to wander off in a sec, just give me one minute, and I'm going to get some uh, cling film. Saranga. Nice piece of the aforementioned plastic stuff. Give that a good scrunch. Don't 
you want it smooth, you want it well scrunched up like that. And then undo it. You've got to find some way of spending your days, haven't you? So, it's all right, Arthur, I'll let you out in a sec. Just a minute. Nearly, nearly there. Right. So on top of this beautifully bright piece of paper, we'll place the saran wrap and just let it touch down very gently. Press it into, well, tap it into place, I would. I wouldn't try and press it down completely because we want this to be fairly random. And then leave it until dry. Place in a moderate oven at 350 degrees Fahrenheit. No, don't do that. Um, yeah, I'll be back in a few minutes when that's completely dry. Okay, so this is dry now and I've got an absolutely fabulously bright, rich, textured, colorful autumnal background here with lots of reds and browns and yellows and golds and everything, which is absolutely marvelous. And where the salt went, you can see that we've got these amazing crystal sort of patterns and some more subtle, crinkly kind of lines from the saran wrap. So that's all perfect as a kind of structure for the autumn leaves that we're going to put on top of this. So in the meantime, I have drawn out three maple, excuse me, maple leaves, um, which I'm going to use to um, position on, on here. You can go freehand if you want, but this is kind of a bit of an easier way of doing it. So you just take your tracing, look at the picture and see where you think the leaves might best go. And I can sort of see a leaf kind of poking out at me here. So I'm going to put one leaf here like that. And in order to be able to do that, of course, I need to put some, um, either some um, carbon paper, which I haven't got, or else I can just go over the back of the tracing of the leaf with some very soft pencil. This is a 6B graphite. Then if I just place that down where I wanted it, then I can come in with a reasonably hard pencil when I want a, something a little bit firmer than that. That bent. Uh, do I have a pencil that bends? What's that all about? Um, okay, so then just go over your outline like that, pressing fairly hard, and you should then, and we'll look in a second, should get, yes, it is there. It's not very clear, but it is there. And I can go over it now in pencil. So my, my idea then, having traced that one, is going to be to um, come in with some ink. There are various different ways you could do this. You don't have to do it this way at all, but if you've got some Indian ink, and uh, in this case, I have got my um, glass pen, and I'm just what I'm going to do is I'm just going to outline where I just did the pencil, uh, outline, I'm just going to go over again in Indian ink. Now this won't run, unlike what happened to us yesterday um, when I did my drawing in water soluble ink, which didn't work. This won't run. So when once it's dry, I'll be able to paint inside it and around it um, without any fear of, of the ink actually running. So, so that's the first one done. And um, I'm going to go ahead and do the rest of them. 
I can hear the coffee finishing in the background there, so that's good. Um, okay, so we'll just go over the other two with our graphite so that I can trace them. Or as I said, you can just freehand it, eyeball it if you want. This is just a quick and easy tip. And oh, if you have a, if you had a light box, one of which I've ordered recently, you'd be able to stick that on there and uh, that would work. Light box would work. Okay, so the second one, I like to think that the leaf is sitting on the area where the most extra is. So I'll put that one there. And uh, I'll just find myself a harder pencil still because I don't think that one worked terribly well. So there's number two. I'm not going to put the veins in yet because we might want to put those in wet in wet. Um, so we'll leave that for the minute and just make that stem a little bit longer. And then um, I think we want to put another one up here. Maybe I'll turn this upside down and have, have that coming down from the top like that. bit easier to see. So we we'll just go over that.
It's a nice little one sitting down there. And we'll be able to see it much better once we go over it in the Indian ink. Okay, so we've got four uh, rule of uh, numbers is you should never have four of anything. Um, so we probably want to put a fifth one somewhere. Um, it would have to be in the middle here, wouldn't it? So it would have to be kind of a small one sort of behind the others. Something like that. Oh yeah, so you could say these were kind of um, abstract, abstract uh, uh, maple leaves and um, the next step is going to be, first of all, we need to rub out our pencil lines. And the next thing is to get ourselves a cup of coffee. Don't need to worry too much about the pencil lines, just the main ones, really. None of them is going to show. Going to show at all. That's an exciting design, isn't it? Back in a sec. Okay, so now the really exciting bit is the next bit here. What we're going to do is we're going to pick up um, colour and emphasise what's already there. So I'm picking up tree bark brown looking for the area on the painting which is nearest to that in colour and then I'm going to reinforce that with plenty of water and plenty of colour so that it just runs into position wherever you feel you'd like it to be. And uh, I'm going to use also um, magenta I think because that's a nice colour like this and I come in where, where the magenta is already strong we come in with more of it. And then where the vermilion is strong, we're going to emphasize that. And then we're going to put plenty more water on so that the whole thing flows into position. And uh, the idea is to really give some dark, whoops, that was wrong. Uh, <coughs> some darkness behind the leaves in some places, so they really stand out. But leave the lightness also. So lots of variety is what we're looking for without losing the texture on the actual leaves. here perhaps, nice strong orange. And then maybe This is kind of what they call negative, 
negative painting when you paint the shadow behind something rather than the actual item thing itself. And if you drop water in, that will push the pigment back. It's quite hard to explain this in words. You just have to really watch it, I think, and see what happens. Get some red in there. You can't paint like this with an ordinary brush. This is really very much a technique that I've developed for working with a water brush. Because it's very hard to drop um, water into into a, into a painting if, um, if you're using an ordinary brush, it doesn't really work. End up with strange things going on. Just gonna encourage that to flow up here a little bit. This is a test for this paper too. Um, this paper, which is just cellulose, wood chip. I'm not noticing any problems with it at the moment at all. So what I'm trying to do is to get some really strong contrasts oi cat no 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 we don't want you up here okay so we've got plenty of color some really nice dark areas and might put a bit more here let that bleed a bit more here, perhaps. Um. Arthur says, hi. I would like to walk all over this painting, but no. So Arthur is going to go and have a little rest. Come on, Arthur. Do you like my painting? <laughs> 